thank you for having me today. Um, and so I want to highlight that a lot of the work I'm presenting to you today is not just work that I did, but it's the work of large teams, right? So it's not just something that I alone did. And so it's the, you know, Apogee and Gala is the work of 50 to 100 people, and none of it would be possible without the hard work of a lot of people besides myself. All right, so I'm going to talk to you about the chemodynamics and evolution of the Milky Way. And why do we want to study the Milky Way? Well, the Milky Way is a really useful laboratory for understanding galaxy evolution in general. Um, for distant galaxies, you can really only get the gross properties because you can't resolve individual stars and stellar populations. But for the Milky Way, you get the full phase space distribution, so that's your position and your velocity. You get the metallicity, you get the ages and the masses of stars, but you get their distributions, right? You can measure all of the stellar population. So you can test galaxy formation theories with much better detail and higher, um, better constraints uh, than you can if you have only unresolved populations. And I'll also highlight that galactic archaeology, which is the study of the Milky Way, is undergoing a revolution because of massive spectroscopic surveys like Apogee and Gala, as well as Gaia. Um, it's really hard to understate how impactful Gaia has been since it came out. Um, so it provides the proper motions and parallaxes for more than a billion stars across the galaxy. Uh, and since Gaia DR2 came out, there's been more than 5,000 papers using Gaia DR2 data. Uh, so you can really start to map the entire chemodynamic structure of the galaxy to a level that we've never been able to do before. So this is an overview of what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to talk to you about where elements come from and the chemistry of stars around the sun, the fact that stars move around, and so we'll do a crash course in galaxy dynamics. Uh, and then we're going to look at some maps of the galaxy that we've never had before and then how we can try and explain those with chemical evolution models. Um, and also how we can use the Milky Way as a test bed for <coughs> sorry, galaxy evolution in general um, by comparing to simulations and um, making data cubes of our, of our observations so that we can actually compare it to large scale surveys like Geckos, which is an ESO-MUSE program that I'm one of the PIs on. All right, so where do the elements come from? So this is kind of the plot that underpins all of what we do in galactic archaeology. And the key take home here is that all the elements on the periodic table come from different metal production sites, and those production sites happen on different time scales. Um, so if you look at something like magnesium, you can see that magnesium is uh, primarily coming from core collapse supernova. And these are supernova from massive stars that explode pretty much instantly after star formation. Um, but if you look at something, <coughs> sorry, I had COVID two weeks ago and it's kind of lingering cough. Um, but if you look at iron, for instance, uh, you can see that its primary contribution is from core collapse supernova and from type 1a supernova. And the key point here is that the type 1a's have a delay time. These are white dwarfs in a binary system, and they take about a billion years after you have star formation to really start going off in large numbers. Um, so if you measure the ratio of magnesium to iron, for instance, uh, that will change with time as you have core collapse early on, and then late, at late times you have type 1a's kick off that are producing lots of iron but no magnesium. And so I'm going to talk to you a, <coughs> a lot about uh, iron peak elements that I'm just going to term metallicity and alpha elements, which are even numbered elements um, from, produced from the alpha process. But the key one is magnesium. Um, and so I'm going to measure the ratio of these two things and compare them. Uh, so you're going to see lots of alpha to iron plots throughout my talk. And they're very useful probes for how the star formation history has proceeded in the galaxy. So if we take uh, two stellar populations, one that has a high star formation rate versus one that has a low star formation rate. Um, the high star formation rate case at the same time will be at a higher metallicity. Right? This kind of makes sense naively. If you have more star formation, you get more supernova. More supernova means more metal production. Okay? So that may more or less makes sense. But if you have, if you look at the alpha to iron ratio, this is what you get. Right? So you have some sort of plateau at early times when you're dominated by this core collapse supernova. And then at some point, the type 1a supernovas start to kick off. And that's where this knee is. Okay? So at this knee, you're getting these type 1a supernova explode. They're making lots of iron, but no alpha. And so your alpha to iron ratio will start to drop. And so that knee is actually independent of your star formation history. So it's a really good clock. Where that knee happens tells you that, oh, it's been a billion years since I started forming stars. And so it's a really useful age indicator uh, for stellar populations. Um, so you can see that the, the high star formation rate case was at a higher metallicity than the low star formation rate case once those type 1a kicked off. And again, that just follows from this plot over here. At a given time, the higher star formation rate population will have higher metallicity. 
Okay. So if you start to look at stars around the sun, we always look at things nearby first because they're the brightest, they're the easiest to observe. What do you actually see when you look at this alpha to iron ratio? Well, this is what you get. So this is a study of, from Adebekion and Haywood in 2013. And you can see, yep, we have all these high alpha metal poor stars. So these are the oldest stars in the galaxy formed be before you had any type 1As kickoff. You also have a knee right here where the type 1As start exploding and your alpha to iron ratio starts dropping and go this way. But we also have this parallel track uh, that's a little interesting, right? So it's like a more metal poor version of this. And it actually looks a lot like that cartoon that we were just talking about, right? Where you had some sort of high star formation rate population and some sort of low star formation rate population. But these stars are all within 50 parsecs of the sun right now. So how on earth do you get these stellar populations that are different in metallicity by a factor of 5 or 10 in the same place? Well, there's some simple models to explain this. One idea is that the disk has been built in phases. So this is called the two infall model. And so what happens is you build this first track. You start at high alpha, metal poor. Type 1As are exploding. Your alpha to iron ratio is dropping. And you reach, ah, oh, sorry, for those of you who aren't astronomers or who aren't working in the abundance plane, whenever you see brackets, that means the abundance is relative to the sun in a logarithmic scale. So an alpha to iron ratio of zero means it's the same as the sun. An alpha to iron ratio of plus one means it's 10 times the sun. And an alpha to iron ratio of minus one means it's 10 times less. Um, so the sun would be at zero, zero in this plot. And then a star that was at minus one in metallicity and solar alpha would be out here. OK? So yeah, you're basically building this disk in the first phase at high alpha metal pore. Type 1As are exploding. Your alpha to iron ratio starts dropping. And you get to some point here. Um, and something happens. So this timing actually happens to be about when Gaia and Celadus fell into the Milky Way. So this is a dwarf galaxy that accreted into the Milky Way between 9 and 10 gig years ago. Um, that might have dumped a fresh supply of gas into the system, right? So you basically got here. You're very metal rich in solar alpha. But then you have this huge satellite come in that kind of resets the whole evolution of the disk because it dumped 10 to the 10 solar masses of gas into your gas reservoir. And so you actually go backwards. Uh, to here, right? So you've diluted the metallicity by a factor of 10 because of this major merger, and then you start forming stars again, right? So that's how, that's how you build this parallel track down here. Uh, so the really nice thing about this two infall model is it explains both the high and low alpha disk, um, but the potential issue here is you have a very specific age metallicity relation, right? So if you look at these metal rich stars, these stars that are three times solar metallicity right here, they can only be old, right? As soon as you have that major merger and you dilute your metallicity, you'll never make a metal-rich star again. So if you look at the ages of metal-rich stars, they better all be old in order for this model to work. And so if you actually look at the data in Galois data, this is what you see. And you can see we have a ton of very metal-rich stars, and they're all very young. Okay? So that two info model doesn't work. Uh, so something else is happening. Right? So we have to try and explain how you get these two tracks in this lower neighborhood. Um, through some other method. And we'll just go through how the disk is built up with ages in this lower neighborhood, just so you can kind of see. You can ignore the color code. I was trying to solve the cosmological lithium problem, but it's really not important for this. The key thing is just how the stars are spaced in this alpha to iron plane as a function of time. So if you look at the very oldest stars, stars older than 12 billion years, you can see they're all high alpha and they're metal poor. Okay? And we're going to step forward in time. Two billion years. So you can see we've had our knee, right? So our type 1As have started to kick off. Uh, the metallicity is increasing, and the alpha to iron ratio is dropping. Okay. Now, if you step forward again, this is where it gets very interesting, right? So these stars, you can see we're again filling in this part of the sequence. But now, all of a sudden, we've had this, this track like turned on in some sense. Um, you can step forward again, and you can see the tracks have, are just continuing. So. This is very hard to explain, right? Because these stars are all within 50 parsecs of the sun now. But the difference between a star here and a star here is almost a factor of 10, right? So the metallicity difference is a factor of 10, but the stars are the same age and the same place. So how do you do that? Um, so hopefully we can answer that. One minor thing that I also want to highlight, this is again why alpha to iron is a really useful age indicator, at least for old things. You can see that once your uh, magnesium to iron ratio is above 0.1, you can almost just read off the alpha to iron ratio and get the age of the star. Uh, so alpha to iron is a very, very useful age indicator for old things. And you can see once you get to like stars younger than 8 giga years or stars in the thin disk, it's solar alpha, not so useful anymore. 
Um, but at least for old things, alpha is really good. So one of the things that could explain these weird sequences we see in the solar neighborhood is that stars are moving around, right? They don't have to stay where they're born. You can move them all over the galaxy. Um, so there's two main methods for doing this. One is called blurring, which is where your stellar orbits are heated with time. So basically you have a star zipping around the galaxy and you run into like a GMC. Or maybe a satellite passes nearby, like through the disk, and heats up your orbit, okay? So in these uh, interactions, your random motion is increased, your eccentricity is increased, but the angular momentum of your orbit doesn't change, okay? There's another thing called migration, or sometimes in the literature it's called churning, where your angular momentum changes, right? So this is called migration, and so you have angular momentum exchange with non-axiosymmetric time-dependent perturbations, which is a lot of words to say the galaxy has spiral arms, and those spiral arms aren't static things, they're transients, okay? So they come and go. And in these interactions, your eccentricity is conserved. So you can go from one circular orbit to another circular orbit, uh, but your angular momentum changes, right? So you can go from the inner galaxy to the outer galaxy or vice versa. So this is a very cartoony picture of what happens in the orbit heating case, right? So you're going around in a circular orbit, you were a star born at four or five kiloparsecs, you run into a GMC, and now your orbit's eccentric. Right? So you still spend most of your time in the inner galaxy, but you can visit the solar neighborhood because your orbit is not circular anymore, okay? Now in the churning and migration case, uh, you actually go from one circular orbit to another, right? So this star, if it migrated, could actually spend most of its time hanging out near the sun, even though it was born at four kiloparsecs, okay? Uh, so these are the two methods that we think can move stars throughout the disk. And so how does this migration with the transient spiral actually work? Well, if you, we do some simple physics here, the spiral pattern is rotating like a solid body, okay? So the velocity of the spiral arm is just dependent on the pattern speed omega and the radius at which you are, okay? So the further out you go, the faster the spiral arm is rotating. Now the stars actually orbit with the flat rotation curve. So for the Milky Way, the rotation curve for the galaxy is like 230 kilometers per second. And so there's a magic place where the spiral arm is moving at the exact same speed as the stars, and that's called co-rotation, okay? So inside co-rotation, the stars are zipping around the galaxy faster than the spiral arms. Outside co-rotation, the stars are moving slower, and the spiral arms will actually catch the stars. And if you have a star very far away from co-rotation in the very inner, inner parts or very outer parts, you'll basically never really interact with the spiral arms because your velocity difference is too big, right? Basically, you'll zip by the spiral arm, the spiral arm will zip by you, and you'll never really feel the interaction because the velocity difference is too great. But if you happen to be sitting just inside or just outside co-rotation, uh, you'll interact with the spiral arm for a long time because you're basically moving at the same speed, okay? And so this is a very simple movie setting this up. So we have a two-arm spiral here, and we have a star just inside co-rotation. So that means the star is moving just a little bit faster than the spiral arm, but it's going to slowly fall towards the spiral arm because it feels the gravitational potential of that arm, right? They're moving at roughly the same speed, and so what happens is it's falling into the arm, which is outside at a larger radius, and so its orbit is increasing, okay? Uh, but what happens once you move outwards, right? So we talked about how the stars outside of co-rotation are now moving slower than spiral arms, is the second spiral arm will actually catch you, right? So we've moved... No, not what I wanted to do. Okay, so yes, we're moving outwards. We're rel slowing down relative to the spiral arms, and so now the what actually happens is the spiral arm behind us will slowly catch up. And so once that arm catches us, we actually feel a tug inwards, okay? And so you'll see in the co-rotating frame of the spiral pattern, you'll actually make a banana shape. You'll oscillate back and forth, basically riding the spiral arms in and riding the spiral arms out forever. But remember what I told you, the spiral arms aren't actually always there. So what happens is you do some portion of this banana shape orbit where you oscillate back and forth between the two arms, and then the spiral arms dissipate, and you're trapped somewhere, right? So if you only did like that much of, the, of, uh, of your horseshoe orbit and then the spiral arms dissipated, you would have moved your orbit two or three kiloparsecs outward, um, and then you're now just going on a circular orbit there forever, right? Because the spiral arm is gone. So how fast can you actually move a star? Um, so this is another movie just showing uh, the efficiency of migration and how far you can move and how quickly. So if we let it go for a billion years, 
Oh, sorry. We have basically three populations we're looking at. Stars born at near the sun are in brown. Stars born at 10 kiloparsecs are in kind of a reddish orange. And then stars at 12 are in orange, are a little bit further out. And so you can see after 1 billion years, this is only three orbits at the solar radius. Uh, stars born at 8 can be as far in as 4 and as far out as 12, right? And now if you let it run forward a little bit more, Right, you get out to the age of the sun. We'll just actually skip forward. Um, you can see now stars born in the solar neighborhood that were in brown can now basically be anywhere in the galaxy after 4 billion years. And same thing for the outer disk. You can see also there's a much greater spread in radii. So this process is very efficient. And within the span of a billion years, you can move several kiloparsecs from where you were born. So if you're trying to understand those chemical distributions that I showed you earlier, you have to keep this in mind, that the present day snapshot we have is being influenced by the fact that the stars are moving all over the place. All right. Can we? All right. So I'm going to start showing you some maps from chemistry from these large scale surveys. And so there's a ton of surveys going on right now. There's Apogee and Galois and Lamost. I'm going to show you some figures from Apogee. And so the great thing about Apogee is it operates in the infrared. Okay. And the nice thing about that is that you don't care about the dust anymore. So you can observe directly in the midplane of the disk and get stars much further away than we could before. Um, and so these, spec these surveys are giving you millions of spectra. And in the future, we're going to have foremost Weave and DESI and SDSS5. Within five or 10 years, we're going to have 100 million stellar spectra. And so it's, it's hard to, to uh, the volume of data we're getting is like an avalanche right now. Because five or 10 years ago, we had maybe 500,000 spectra, right? Right now, we have about 10 million. And then in five or 10 years, we're going to have 100 million, right? So we're increasing the amount of data we have by an order of magnitude every five or 10 years. Um, so the, the quality and, the, and the, the volume of data we have for understanding the galaxy is, is increasing quite a lot. Now, uh, every panel I'm showing you here is going to be a different area in the galaxy, right? So this is the first full map we've ever had of the Milky Way disk in that alpha iron plane. So it might look a little intimidating with all the panels, so we'll just kind of break it up into small chunks. So the y-axis in all these plots is alpha to iron. The x-axis is iron. And then the inner galaxy is on the far left, right? So 3 to 5 kiloparsecs. The outer galaxy is on the far right. And the solar neighborhood is at 8, so it's in this panel here. And these are stars in the thin disk or near the plane, OK? And so you can see the inner galaxy is very, very metal rich, right? So about three times solar uh, is where most of the stars are. The solar neighborhood is, unsurprisingly, at solar metallicity for most of the stars. And then the outer disk, you can see, is at minus 0.5. So it's about three or four times less than solar. So there's a very strong gradient where the inner galaxy is metal rich and the outer galaxy is metal poor. Okay. As we start marching above the plane, this is now 500 parsecs to a kiloparsec above the plane. You can see now we have our high alpha stars appearing. right? So in the inner galaxy, we have these high alpha populations. And so these are the oldest stars in the disk, right? We, saw, we talked about this before. If you're high alpha, you're basically the first star formation in the first billion years of the Milky Way. Now, as you march outwards in radius, you can see those high alpha stars start to disappear. And by the time you're out here, you can see that you're solar alpha again, right? So those high alpha stars seem to be concentrated in the center of the galaxy. And if we go to the thick disk high above the plane, we see the same thing repeated. The high alpha populations are dominant high above the plane. And then in the solar neighborhood is where they start to peter out, right? And by the time you get out here, you're only solar alpha again. Now, in an unhappy coincidence, if you look at the metallicity of these stars in the thick disk, the outer disk is still at minus 0.5. And the inner disk is at also around minus 0.5. So if you just measured the metallicity of the thick disk, you would say, oh, the thick disk is uniform. It's all metallicity minus 0.5. But actually, these stars on the left in the inner galaxy are the oldest stars in the Milky Way. And the stars on the right are maybe 2 or 3 billion years old. So these are very, very different stellar populations. They just happen to have the same metallicity in our, in our galaxy. So we'll just look at the whole map without anything hidden. I also want to highlight this panel here. Uh, so this panel in the very inner galaxy looks a lot like our simple uh, chemical evolution model from our cartoon at the start, right? We started off at high alpha metal pore. We got to some point where type 1a kicked off around here, and the alpha to iron ratio starts dropping. right? And so it's probably what's happening in the solar neighborhood is we're seeing this chemical track of the inner galaxy that's very efficient at forming stars superimposed on this lower track down here. 
And so it's actually the superposition of two very simple things uh, that make it look complicated. Right? So we don't need these loops and crazy zigzags in our chemical evolution. You're probably seeing the in situ evolution going on this lower star formation rate track and the inner galaxy chemical evolution on this far right track. Um, and so what's the, why we can observe that in the solar neighborhood is again this radial mixing. Right? So we've moved stars from the inner galaxy to the solar neighborhood, which is why we see these superposition of populations. One question you might ask is, how common are these bimodal sequences of high and low alpha stars that we see? Uh, so if you look in the simulations, you might not be able to see that. Uh, it says that if you look in Eagle, that Milky Way chemistry is approximately in 5% of the galaxies. So the Milky Way seems to be very rare when you look at these uh, large cosmological simulations. Um, and so there, they find that uh, you need a special merger event uh, to actually make the disk. Um, so one other thing you can look at uh, to get a handle on this migration is the metallicity distribution, right? So this is just the fraction of stars at different metallicities. And we can look at it as a function of radius. So if you look at the inner galaxy, the black and the blue there, uh, you can see it's very metal rich, but it's a negatively skewed distribution, right? You have a tail towards low metallicities, okay? But as you march outwards in radius, the shape actually changes. So the solar neighborhood in teal is roughly Gaussian. But then as you march outwards, you can see you're much more metal poor, right? Because we have that gradient. Uh, but you actually have changed the shape. So now you have a tail towards high metallicities, not low. Uh, and so if you measure the skewness, which is the third order moment of a Gaussian, uh, you can actually see it's almost linear, where you go from very negatively skewed in the inner galaxy to positively skewed in the outer disk. And so if you look at MDFs from simple chemical evolution models, the details of the models that I'm showing you from Andrew's studio are, are not really important. The key thing to look at is the MDF, which is this thing on the top. And so it doesn't matter what knob you turn in the model. You can change the inflow rate, the outflow rate, different star formation efficiencies. The MDF is always the same shape, right? And the peak might move, it might get broader, but it's always negatively skewed, right? And so it doesn't matter what knobs you have in your chemical evolution, you're never going to get a positively skewed MDF, OK? So what's going on here? Well, this is, again, the fact that stars are moving around the galaxy, right? So it could be that migration is actually changing the shape of our metallicity distribution functions by moving stars around. So we made a toy model with negatively skewed MDFs that have the gradient in there. So you can see the inner galaxy is metal rich and the outer galaxy is metal poor. And then we said, OK, what if we just have some orbit heating from GMCs and stuff? Uh, so that's the blurring. And you can see it doesn't really change the shape, right? You go from negatively skewed to slightly less negatively skewed, but it's not enough to, get the, the, to go to positive. Now, if you turn on churning or migration, um, you can actually get it to work, right? So the inner galaxy is still negatively skewed, but as you march outwards, you can see now we have this tail towards positive metallicities. Uh, and, the, and this gamma here is the skewness, and you can see it's 0.3. So we've actually gone from negatively skewed to positively skewed, and so what's happening is we're moving metal-rich stars from the inner parts of the galaxy to the outer parts, and that's where these tails are coming from. So the, uh, the higher order moments of the MDF are actually like the smoking gun for migration. All right, so we want to try and build a model to explain this map that we have. Uh, obviously, we need to track how the abundance of vary with position, because we saw that the chemical map was very different if you're in the inner galaxy versus the outer galaxy. And we want to identify the likely formation pathway for the thick disk. Uh, and so this is work that one of my students, uh, Bo Kwan Chin, did. He's now a postdoc at ANU. Um, and so we built upon the pioneering work of Shonar Chin Bini, who were like the first ones to really include radial migration into chemical evolution models. And so we're building a chemical evolution model with this in mind. We want to move stars around and see if we can explain the observations. So we have a lot of ingredients. Um, we have multiple radial zones. Obviously, we need to track how the abundances vary with position. We have a two-phase ISM, right? So you have cold gas and warm gas within the system. And then we have also the gas, pro gas processes, right? We have accretion from the IGM. We have gas cooling. And then we have radial flow within the gas, uh, of gas within the system. Um, and the reason for that is that the stellar disk in the Milky Way is roughly exponential. And so you need to make the gas disk roughly exponential to maintain that. Uh, we have star formation and stellar evolution. And part of that stellar evolution is supernova yields and their according delay time distributions, right? So the type 2 supernova explode real quick. The type 1As have a delay. We also have AGB yields. Uh, so we actually track about 80 abundances within the model. And then the key here is that we radially mix stars and gas. 
So we have both blurring and migration prescriptions in the model, and so we can track this movement of stars within the system. Our time step for the model is set at the maximum age of a type 2 supernova, which is 30 million years. So basically, an 8 solar mass star is the lowest mass star that will explode as a type 2, and they live about 30 million years. So that's our time step. And then the last thing that we said is we want a smooth gas accretion history with no major mergers. Um, and so can we reproduce the observations with a more steady state evolution rather than this merger-driven scenario uh, that some people in the literature say is, say is necessary? So we load, to start up the model, we load all our yield tables. We initialize the each radial zone with some gas. And then we just start going through this loop. Uh, so you load the gas from the first time step. Then you cool gas from warm to cold. And then you have star formation from your cold gas reservoir. You evolve stars. They explode. They have yields returned to your gas reservoir. Then you migrate stars throughout the system. And then you have the fresh infall of gas and the radial flow of gas. And then you say, have I been running for 12 billion years? If not, then you go through the loop again. And so you just run this for 12 billion years. Uh, for those of you who might be interested in what our star formation history looks like, uh, so we tried several different prescriptions, but the one for the, the plots I'm going to show you is in blue here. And so you can see it is very high at the start, so about 25 solar masses per year early on. So if you were doing extra galactic work, you would call this a starburst. Uh, but you can see that it varies smoothly with time, right? It's just an exponential decline to maybe a few solar masses per year today, okay? And so this is the tracks you get. Um, the inner galaxy track is on the far right here. Uh, each, the spacing is 1.5 kiloparsecs, so that's at 2, this will be at 3.5, that'll be at 5, and so on. Uh, the outer galaxy is on the far left, and the solar neighborhood is in red. Um, the background data is data from the solar neighborhood, so you can immediately see that this, the tracks that go through the high alpha sequence are from the inner galaxy, right? So what we're probably seeing uh, in, those, in the data is the chemical evolution of the inner disk for these high alpha stars. The other thing that we're tracking here is the time evolution. So everything starts off pristine uh, and high alpha, and then each dot is a factor of 1.5 giga years. So we started off at 12, then here we are at 10.5, 9, and so on. And so you can see after only a couple giga years, we are at solar metallicity, and the alpha to iron ratio has already started dropping. Right? So within the first few billion years of the model, the inner galaxy is already very, very, very metal rich. Um, and so the, the chemical enrichment, you can see, is very rapid early on and then slows down at late times. So if you look at all the dots here, they're all kind of stacked on top of each other at late times. So there's also a strong gradient, right? The inner galaxy is metal rich, the outer galaxy is metal poor. And yeah, I already highlighted that the high alpha stars are probably born from these tracks belonging to the inner galaxy. Now, if you put uh, the migration and blurring prescriptions in, this is the maps you get for chemistry now. So you can see in the plane and the thin disk, we're very metal rich in the inner galaxy. And as you march outwards in radius, you can see we get to more and more metal pore. So there's that strong gradient we had in the data in the thin disk. Now, as you march upwards, you can see that in the thick disk high above the plane, uh, the, they're made up of high alpha metal pore stars in the inner galaxy. So just like the data. And as you march outwards, you can see we're dominated by solar alpha populations again. And the solar neighborhood, this eight to the, uh, the seven, nine bin, you can see is always at this nice confusing bimodal distribution of populations. So we basically reproduced all the observables from the data with our model. And so this is the first time that anybody's actually been able to do this particular map. Uh, so it took about 10 years since I originally made the map, um, but we're getting there. I won't spend too much time on this plot. I just I wanted to highlight that the model has a lot of parameters. And some of them are a little degenerate. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, tweaking that you can do in the model to basically make the tracks. Um, but if you're a novice in chemical evolution and you're interested in what different things do, like if you change the star formation efficiency or you change the efficiency of radial migration, our paper has plots for that. And you can learn about what different things do. Um, and so yeah, there's just a lot of knobs to turn. And that kind of will get into why we want to look at other galaxies besides the Milky Way. So this is the summary here. We developed the first chemical evolution model that actually reproduces the data. Um, and we are able to reproduce the high alpha disk and the bimodal distributions of the stars in the solar neighborhood with no major mergers. Right? This was just a steady state evolution. And so that might imply that this might be a natural evolution of disk galaxies rather than a rare event. Because right? all the other things we saw required a very specific merger timing in order to reproduce the observations. 
Um, and in fact, mergers might actually goof it up in our case, right? Now there's a lot more things to look at. I told you we tracked 80 abundances within the model, and I showed you two of them. Uh, so <laughs> there's lots more things to dive into, like the uh, neutron capture abundances. Uh, there's more gas processes that we can model. And currently, we're assuming that the galaxy is uh, azimuthally symmetric. So the metallicity at one radius is the same no matter where in the disk you are. Um, but that might not be true, right? It could be that you're slightly more metal rich in spiral structure than you are off spiral structure. And so uh, the next thing to do is make the model into three dimensions to take into azimuthal variation into account. OK, so like I highlighted, the Milky Way is only a single galaxy, right? You can't constrain all of galaxy evolution with one data point. Uh, so what we're going to try and do is take our models that now actually work uh, to identify Milky Way analogs in simulations and identify the range of formation pathways um, to try and do that and determine which processes are critical to producing realistic galaxies. Uh, we're also going to build data cubes from our chemical evolution models to directly compare to external observations. So the data coming out from uh, things like MUSE is now actually getting to a quality that you can they look like Milky Way uh, studies these days. And so um, we're going to build an IFU data cube so you can directly com make an apples to apples comparison of something that you observe with MUSE with the Milky Way. And so I'll also talk about the Geckos program, uh, which is a large ESO program to look at edge-on galaxies uh, and directly map the chemistry structure as a function of radius and Z. Uh, so we can directly compare the Milky Way to these systems. Um, now, when you're make, making Milky Way data cubes, we actually do it the exact opposite way that someone looking at external galaxies would do. So if you took an IFU cube, you'd get an integrated spectrum uh, in each spaxel. Then you'd run it through PPXF with whatever stellar population library you're interested in. That'll give you your kinematics, right? Your velocity, the distribution, and the higher order moments in terms of the, the skewness and kurtosis. And you can also get the chemical compositions out from this software, right? Um, However, for the Milky Way, we actually already know the end outputs from that, right? And we actually want to go backwards and say, OK, we're, we, ha we know the age, metallicity, and velocity distributions um, from our model. We can sample those distribution functions to make like an in-body type model of the galaxy. We can put the Milky Way at some distance, like 20 megaparsecs. You can change the inclination. And then you can say, all right, I want to generate an integrated spectrum for each spaxel for the galaxy at that distance, OK? So that's what my student Permodal has been working on. So he's actually taken the chemical evolution model that Chen and I made uh, and turned it into a Milky Way data cube. Right? So he's now basically showing you what the, spaxel, the spectrum of the, the galaxy in that pixel looks like. Um, and he reproduces you know, these nice alpha metallicity and age maps of the Milky Way, but in this data cube format so you can directly compare it to Muse. And I want to highlight now, this is a study from Marie Martig about how good the IFU data is actually getting. So you can see that the map that Marie has made here is actually very comparable to what we have for the Milky Way, right? So the x-axis would be like your radius plot here. The y-axis would be the z component out of the plane. And so you can see that she seems, sees a lot of the same structures, right? So hot, the thick disk is dominated by high alpha stars, at least in the inner parts, and maybe goes to lower alpha on the outskirts. Uh, and the thin disk is dominated by solar alpha populations. You can also see that there's uh, the inner, the in-plane stuff is very metal rich, and as you go upwards, it's more metal poor. And you can also see the age distribution, right? The thick disk is old, and the thinner disk out here is younger stars, right? So these are very comparable data products to what we have to the Milky Way today. And so that's what motivated this Geckos program that I went on the PIs on. So it's a large ESO program on Muse. We got 340 hours of observing time to observe 35 edge-on galaxies to, fit to very high signal to noise. So we're going, uh, most IFU studies focus on the central components, but we want to go out to 3RE, which is roughly where the sun is in the Milky Way, um, to really probe the stru stellar structure of these galaxies uh, to high precision. Um, our sample of galaxies is shown in the bottom left here. So they're all similar stellar mass to the Milky Way at around 10 to the 10.5 to 10 to the 10.7.5. but Otherwise, the properties are different, right? Some galaxies are barred, some are not barred. Uh, there's a huge range in star formation history, so some are star bursting, some are like the Milky Way in the main sequence, and then some are much lower star formation rates that are basically red, you might call red and dead kind of systems with very low star formation rates. Um, so we want to try and look at these, a range of properties to figure out what are the key drivers of disk galaxy evolution. 
And because the data quality is so good from this stuff, we can actually apply our detailed chemical evolution models now on these external galaxies and help break some of the degen degeneracies from the, that kind of scary plot of all the different parameters that you can tweak in our models. And this is just a, a slide showing all of our, our sample. Um, and so you can see we've got 35 edge on systems. We're going to map the vertical structure and measure things like outflows and the impact of the bar on the stellar distributions. Uh, the other thing we can do with our models is actually directly compare them to simulations. So that's something that I'm working on right now. So I've taken our Milky Way model, which is this thing here, and I've compared it to a suite of simulations from Chiaki Kobayashi and Phil Taylor um, to look at you know, what, how similar the Milky Way is in chemistry to some of these external systems. And I basically fed this into a machine learning algorithm called TISNI to say, can you identify galaxies that are like the Milky Way? And so each dot here on this plot is actually a separate galaxy uh, from their simulation. And I fed it the chemical distributions, I fed it star formation histories, I fed it stellar mass, and I fed it structural properties like the scale length of the galaxies. And I said, OK, I can't think in 30 dimensional space. Can you do it for me and identify galaxies that are similar? Right? So that's what Tisney does. It's kind of like a principal component analysis um, to reduce the dimensionality of the data. And so that's what I've done here. And you can see uh, that it actually broke it into kind of two main directions in the Tisney plot. Uh, so stellar mass is low on the top right and high in the bottom, sorry, it's low in the top left and high in the bottom right. And then stars at the top of the diagram here have high, higher fractions of high alpha populations, while galaxies down here have high fractions of low alpha populations. So the Milky Way is down here, so it's high mass and dominated by low alpha. You can see that about 80% of the stellar mass for the Milky Way is the solar alpha. Um, and the if you look at a dot near it, uh, in terms of fraction of low alpha, that would be this orange dot here. right? So I've shown the chemistry for this galaxy in orange. So it's a much lower mass system, uh, but you can see that most of its stars are also solar alpha. Right? So even though the, the mass difference between the Milky Way and this galaxy is, you know, the Milky Way is five or ten times bigger, it does have similar chemistry. Um, but if you look at a more massive system, like this one in Teal, um, you can see the chemical distribution for this is much different. Right? So almost half the stellar mass of this galaxy is in the high alpha population. Um, and so TISNI is a really useful tool to help you identify what is a Milky Way analog. Because right? often when you look at simulations, they just say, oh, just choose something that's similar in stellar mass. Um, but that's probably not the best thing to do. Because right? we see this galaxy actually chemically looks very like the Milky Way, but is very different in mass. And we also know that from our nearest neighbor, Andromeda, uh, it's identical mass to the Milky Way, but very, very different in terms of its chemical and structural properties. Right? So stellar mass is not necessarily the best thing to use. And so what I'm saying is you should use every piece of information you have and use something like TISNI to kind of piece through that information for you. So the goal now is to use several different suites of simulations like FIRE, Illustrious, Eagle, Auriga, and try to repeat this analysis and just identify which simulations are doing the best, what are the key physical properties in the simulations that are giving you Milky Way analogs, and what range of formation pathways lead you to the Milky Way. Right? It's probably not a unique pathway. Um, and there might be very different wa ways to get to similar chemistry as the Milky Way. All right. Uh, so this is my conclusions. Uh, we made the first chemi complete chemical map of the galaxy. We saw that it, the chemistry varied strongly with position. Uh, we saw that radial mixing is really important and also very annoying in trying to interpret our snapshot that we have. Um, and we developed the first chemical evolution model to reproduce nearly all the observables. Right. So we made. The chemical maps, I didn't show it, but we also reproduced the MDF skewness changes. Um, and we saw that we didn't need a major merger to do that. Um, so bimodal ke chemical disk might be common. And so it might hint that that simulation that I showed you for Eagle might be wrong. Right? There's something incorrect in their star formation history. And I actually forgot to highlight, but if you look at Marie Martig's galaxy, the chemistry here is nearly identical to the Milky Way. And we have this quality data for two or three other systems now. And it seems like the Milky Way chemistry is quite common. So there's something in these simulations that isn't quite right, and it's probably related to um, star formation feedback. It's probably too strong um, in these models. Um, but anyways, the simulations need quite a lot of work, and so we can help inform them where they're wrong. Um, and so yeah, we're also using the Milky Way as a test bed for galaxy evolution by comparing to these simulations and from the Skeko's program 
uh, where we're actually starting to get very high quality observables for external systems that we can directly compare to our data. Okay. So in your simulation, I saw one parameter, the hypernova fraction of 50%. Uh, does it, do you assume that for entire metallicity or? There's not a metallicity evolution with that, no. So that's apparently inconsistent with the super observation. So is it important parameter or can you? It's, not per it's, it's, it's more important for, not for magnesium and iron necessarily, but for some of the other elements. Yeah that we didn't show plots of, that it would matter for that. And so we just took that number from Chiaki Kobayashi. Yeah. Um, we don't know at the zero or early, you know, low meters, but, uh, you know, near, nearby universe, we know that 50% is really too much. Too much, yeah. So I wonder, yeah. Yeah, so it, it doesn't affect these plots, but if you look at some of the, like, the neutron capture abundances, it will definitely have an impact there. Um, and so, yeah, that's something that, we can look at it a little bit more closely. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is something I'm a little ignorant of. And so Chalky was like, oh, 50% is fine. So yeah, we're like. We don't know, you know, uh, fast stars and so on. So that assumption for the fast stars may be fine, but uh, shouldn't get up to nearby universe. Yeah. Some. Yep. So it's actually that it's good that we have this table, so we have a lot of things here. But do you think there are some things missing here in this table? I'm sure there are, but I mean, for example, let's say binary to multiplicity, because I think, at least if you look on global clusters, I think the binary evolution could actually affect the yields and other, you know, other elements. So yes, yeah, so uh, we don't have, uh, everything is assumed to be a single star. Um, yeah, so binary evolution will affect, again, a lot of these neutron capture abundances. Um, but at least for the overall metallicity, it won't have a huge impact if you average over the whole solar population. But, I mean, if you want to look at more things than this, yes, for sure. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned, there's still things that we need to improve. Like, we don't have galactic fountains, right, which is a good recycling process where you actually blow gas out of the disk from supernova and it rains back on to the outer parts. Um, and again, I, I said that we uh, assumed the galaxy was as mutually symmetric, which is not necessarily true. So there's lots of things to improve, right? Um, and add, the, but you know, we already have a lot of parameters. Um, and we were still happy that we reproduced the data because nobody's been able to do it yet, right? So our model is the first one that actually does at least from a cursory glance, reproduce the observations. Um, right. Yeah, that makes sense. And do you think yeah, there's like a, some? Do you think there's some <coughs> relations between various parameters here? Because again, I, if I go back to binarity, I mean, if you have more binaries, maybe it could affect like the relational distributions of. Yes. So, and one of the things is the fraction of um, systems that will explode is type one a. So at, that actually, where b binaries come in, is only from the type one a's. Um, and it's just what fraction of stars in the mass range will explode. And if your binary fraction is a function of, say, metallicity, uh, the binary fraction, so the fraction of stars that explode as type 1a might also be a function of metallicity, right? So um, we think that the binary fraction is higher, for instance, for metal poor populations. So it could be that early on, the fraction of stars that explode as a type 1a supernova is much higher than the present day because the binary fraction was two or three times higher. Um, so yes, definitely things to, <laughs> to look at, particularly with binarity, yeah. Yeah. Well, I ask people, patients, think of some questions to ask, it's fine. Identical <laughs> questions. So, yeah, I was just wondering maybe about like like 2D versus 3D galaxy models, because I think if you at least think about migration and spiral arms, I just imagine you have some kind of vertically averaged kind of potential and you kind of uh, move the star around. Yeah. But when you show like the plots from the, from the results from the evolution, you do see some like the variation in like different heights. For yeah. Example, you have like more younger stars in the. Yeah, so I didn't highlight the velocity dispersion. So we actually, that's also the key ingredient. So I, I mentioned that we have this blurring, but I didn't say what we did for it. Um, so this is work that Sanjeev Sharma and I did a couple of years ago. And we actually measured how quickly stars are heated with time. 
And it's, that's a function of like three or four properties, but it's their age, their location in the galaxy, their metallicity, and their height above the plane basically governs the velocity dispersion. And so we have some prescriptions in there that basically says, yeah, this is how an orbit gets heated with time and average over the whole disk. And so that's why you get younger stars in the plane because they've had less time to be heated, right? And, and so the older you are, the more chance you have to scatter off things like molecular clouds. And so that's why the, the outskirts tend to be populated by older things because you have to have time to get up there. Um, now there is, this is kind of getting into the details, but there actually is something about the efficiency of both heating and migration based on your position in the disk that we actually don't have in the model, but is like a next step. Um, so if you think about it, if you're migrating because of a spiral arm, the scale height of the spiral arm is only like 50 parsecs. Um, so there's a bias in which stars preferentially, mi you're preferentially migrating cooler populations. And by cooler, I mean dynamically cold. Um, because uh, it's the same thing with the velocity, right? If you're never near the spiral arm, it's not going to migrate you. So the, the migration is preferentially on the stars that stay in the plane. Um, and so that gives you a bias towards stars on very circular orbits. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, on your question, you have a follow up question, so go ahead. Um, how well can you constrain the magnesium and ion ratios, and how well do you know that they are the values that the star was born with and not something that was polluted under the surface or or dredged? Ah, so that's a pretty good question. So the the magnesium to iron is is fairly constant within the star. Um, now there are exceptions if you're in a very like a very close binary or something where the star one of the stars is overfilled with Roche lobe and is actually contributing directly onto the surface. You might measure something a little different. Um, but for most single stars when you observe them, the magnesium to iron is pretty good. Um, and there's only certain areas in the HR diagram um, along the main sequence turnoff where um, you get some deviations due to like internal mixing within the star um, that can change the magnesium to iron ratio. Um, and actually, so the magnesium to iron ratio will stay the same, but the um, overall metallicity, basically on the turnoff region, all of the heavy elements are slightly depleted, okay? Um, relative to the initial composition of the star, right? Just through stellar evolution, you get this area in the HR diagram where the abundances go down. Um, but they mostly vary together, right? So the magnesium to iron ratio itself won't change, but the iron to hydrogen ratio or the metallicity, you'd measure a lower number. Um, but for the maps I was showing you, we were always observing giants. And so the magnesium to iron and the iron to hydrogen should be more or less constant or, or basically the initial abundance of the star. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So if there are no further questions, either here or in the chat, I see there aren't any. So yeah, let's thanks uh, Michael again.